Good morning, everybody. Now, let's see here. I'm going to read a chapter of this book, The Fields of Home, by Ralph Moody. And as you might guess, it takes place in Maine, by that picture of the hay rack being pulled by the team of horses, and a man pitching hay up onto the load, and a woman up on top building the load. The barn and the house in the background, it's in Maine. Uh, Lisbon Falls, about 60 or 70 miles from here. Now, this is at, at the request of Bert. He'd like to hear this chapter because he read the book years ago when he was in school. Now, let's see, as you can see by the clock over my shoulder, it's about 20 minutes of seven. That clock, by the way, I bought at a yard sale on Campobello Island uh, last summer. One or two, uh, the last summer, I think, a year ago this summer. And I liked it, and immediately, I think I paid a dollar for it at the yard sale. Ugh. So, let's see. So, hello, first, to Brett and Cora in China, Gary and Ingrid up in Jackman, Susanna and Dave in Philadelphia, Katie and Bernie in Palermo, near Liberty, here in Maine, and Adam and Lindsay in Bangor. If you listen to it, I hope you all enjoy it. Chapter 1. Oh, this is by Ralph Moody, by the way, okay? Chapter 1, From Colorado to Maine. <clears throat> when we moved from Colorado to Massachusetts at the beginning of 1912, the other children slid into city life as a flock of ducklings into a new pool. I tried as hard as I could to be a city boy, but I didn't have very good luck. Just little things that would have been all right in Colorado were always getting me into trouble. Out there, after Father died, the sheriff was about the best friend I had. He helped me get jobs with the cattle drovers that went through town. He always told them I was as dependable as any man. In Medford, the police chief seemed to think just the opposite. Before I'd finished the eighth grade, our house was the first place he came to when anything went wrong in town. Medford is, I'd say, a, a suburb of Boston in Massachusetts, for those who don't know. My worst trouble came on graduation day. The night before, one of the boys in my class, who was crazy about cowboys, was waiting when I finished my after-school job in the grocery store. He'd sent away to a mail lot house for a forty-five caliber revolver and a hundred cartridges. He had them with him. He wanted me to go up to the woods and teach him how to shoot. That would have been too dangerous, so I told him he'd have to wait till morning. Then we could go down to the river and shoot into the water where no one could be hurt. By the way, he said he'd sent away to a mail order house that was probably Sears Roebuck at that time. I knew quite a little about revolvers and had learned to handle one when I was 10. What I didn't know was that there was a law against shooting one in Medford and that bullets skip on the water the way stones do. We had skipped nearly 50 of them over into Somerville when the policemen came and arrested us. <laughs> they kept us at the police station all morning, and the chief said the only safe place for me was the reform school. Before he let me go, Mother had to promise to send me right away to her father's farm in Maine. I took the night boat from Boston to Bath, then rode the 20 miles over to Lisbon Falls on the Lewiston trolley car. Mother had told me that the easiest way to find Grandfather's farm would be to go up the main street, follow straight ahead for three miles, then turn up the hill road when I came to a big three-story brick house. The few people I passed on the sidewalks seemed to look me over from head to foot, but nobody spoke. I was sure they all knew I'd been sent down there so I wouldn't have to go to the reform school. I bit my teeth together hard, kept looking at the ground, walked as fast as I could till I was out of the village. Let's see. Then I stopped, set my suitcase down, and tried to make up my mind if it wouldn't be better for me just to run away and go back to Colorado. I'd grown a lot since we'd moved east, would be 15 in the fall, and knew I could earn a man's wages on a ranch. If I went back west, I'd be able to send money to mother every month. People wouldn't be looking at me as if I were a criminal, and everybody would be a lot better off. I had just about made up my mind to go when I heard a rumbling and pounding on the road behind me. A big, skinny, gray horse, hitched to a blue dump cap, was clumping toward me. 
At every lumbering step, the box of the rump cat tipped up a little and bumped down against the shafts. Above the horse's rump, I could see a battered old straw hat that jounced in time to the bumping of the cat. I didn't want to be standing there when they went by, so I picked up my suitcase and walked on. The thumping trot slowed to a walk as the horse came abreast of me, and the man hollered, Whoa, Etta! in a sort of gurgly roar. I didn't want to see or talk to anybody right then, but of course I had to stop and look up at the man. He was big and round-shouldered. Sitting there on a board across the low sides of the dump cart, his knees were nearly up to his chin. His overalls were dirty, had a hole in one knee that grey underdraws showed through. He had squinty blue eyes, a reddish-brown walrus mustache, and hadn't shaved for at least a week. As I looked around, he spit a mouthful of tobacco juice that just missed my suitcase and plopped into the road dust. Hot, hang it, he said. Going to the Four Corners? It wasn't very hot for June, and I didn't know where the Four Corners might be, so I said, No, sir. Where be you going? And he spit again. From the way he blurted the question, I thought he might be the sheriff, and I didn't want to get in any more trouble. So I said, To Mr. Gould's farm. Tom Gould? Yes, sir. Get in. I'll fetch you a piece. The horse didn't move till the man slapped over the reins and fished on them a few times. For several minutes, he didn't say a word. Just sat there with the reins loose, looking at Edda's rump, his hands resting across his knees. Then, without looking toward me, he asked, Who be you? Ralph Moody, was all I said. In two or three minutes more, he asked, Where from? Boston. That seemed to interest him. He only waited for Edda to take three or four steps before he said, Big place, ain't it? Yes, sir, I told him. The farther we went, the less I liked to ride with the man. By the time he'd asked me about Boston, I was sure he wasn't the sheriff, but I couldn't just climb down and start walking again, so I sat and planned how I'd go to Colorado. I only had 80 cents, but that didn't worry me any. It was the beginning of summer, haying time, and I knew I could get plenty of work on farms. There was no hurry. It wouldn't make any difference if it took me till fall. I wouldn't actually be running away. I'd just be going back where everybody liked me where the sheriff was my friend. Mother would know where I was all the time because I'd work as I went, would send her money as I earned it. I was just wondering how I'd get across the wide rivers like the Mississippi when the man beside me asked, what are you going to Tom's for? Ken of hisn? I didn't want to answer any more questions than I had to, so I just said, to work, and went on thinking about getting across the Mississippi. For the first time since I'd climbed onto the cap, the man turned his head and looked at me. What's Tom paying you? he asked. I don't know, was all I said. Don't know? God Almighty, do you know Tom Gould? Yes, sir, I told him. I really didn't know Grandfather. Mother said I'd seen him when I was three, but all I knew about him was from stories I'd heard her tell. Besides, it didn't seem to me it would be a good idea to say I was his grandson when I intended to go right on west without seeing him. The man swung his head away and spit hard, as though he'd just tasted something bitter. Then he turned back to me and said, Well, you will afore the day's out. Ain't a meaner man a living. Skin a louse for hide and tell. I was glad I'd made up my mind to go back to Colorado. Since I'd probably never see Grandfather anyway, it wouldn't make any difference to me how mean he was. I wanted to hear just what else a man might say about him. So I just said, Yes? Dang tootin', so consigned cantankerous that can't nobody get on with him, except in that woman, woman of his. Then he stopped talking, just sat looking at Edda's rump for a minute or two. I didn't know there was a woman, I said. Mill Durkin, housekeeper, cussed contrary as old Tom himself, fight like two straight cats in a rain barrel. Has to stay there, won't nobody else put up with her. Get up, Edda. Ahead of us, a three-story brick house came into sight beyond the pine wood lot. I knew that would be where Grandfather's road turned off. What I was going to do seemed easy enough from there. I'd say goodbye to this man at the corner, then walk up the hill road till he was out of sight, turn into the woods, and go back to the trolley line. But first, I wanted to find out what else he might say about Grandfather, so I asked, How long has Miss Durkin been there? 
Ain't Miss Durkin. Mills a spinster, about thirty. Been there five, six, seven years, I calculate. Only help Tom ever had that stayed over two or three days. You won't, neither. Can't do nothing to suit him. Work the hide off of you. Feed you on sow belly and boiled potatoes. Run his own boys off before they was growed. I thought I'd heard about as much as I wanted to, so I kept still and went back to planning about going west. We were nearly to the four corners when I noticed that the man was looking me over from head to foot. When I looked up at his face, he said, Might look me up when you get fed up at Tom's. Name Swale, the other side of the brook. Might use a likely-looking boy. He jerked his head to the right, the opposite direction from Grandfather's, and added, don't need to mention it to Tom. I didn't want to hear him talk about Grandfather anymore. I knew Mother loved her father, and from stories that she'd told us about her girlhood on the old farm, I was sure he couldn't be half as bad as Mr. Swale said he was. I knew his younger brother, Uncle Levi, too. He was an old bachelor who lived in Boston. He had been out to see us half a dozen times since we moved east. Every time he came, he'd been loaded down with fruit, nuts, and candy, and I didn't know a man I liked any better. I reached back for my suitcase and said, I'm going to walk. Mr. Swale put one dirty hand over my over on my leg and said, Set right still, set right still. Tain't no load at all on Etta. These hills is powerful steep for lugging a heavy valise. Hot this morning, ain't it? This time I just said, Yes, without any sir on it, and moved my leg away a little. Then I tried to think some more about how I'd go to Colorado, but I couldn't seem to get Grandfather out of my head. The next thing I knew, I was remembering things Mother had told us about him. He was born when his father was 73, had gone to the Civil War before he was 21, had contracted malaria in a Confederate prison, and never got over it. Before I thought, I said, Mr. Gould isn't very well, is he? That's depending, Mr. Swale snickered. Tom Gould can heist a bull out of a well if he's had put or showing off, but he's too puny to fetch a pail of water for somebody else about that he can shrink it off onto. Then he bellowed, Morning, Miss Little Hale. I'd been so busy thinking I hadn't paid much attention to the roll of the scenery. I did know that we'd passed a couple of houses since we'd turned off from the main road, but if anyone had asked me, I couldn't have told them what either of them looked like. It wasn't until Mr. Swell hollered, I noticed a woman putting a letter into the mailbox at the house fifty yards ahead of us. Except that she was short and sort of fat, I couldn't tell what she looked like, because she had on a sunbonnet that came way out beyond her face. She didn't look up until she'd taken a newspaper out of the box and held it up in front of the bonnet for a minute. Then she turned and called, "'Morning, Badger. What brings you up this way?' Her face and voice seemed to go exactly with her body. They were both round and sort of mellow, but hearty. I liked her from the moment she spoke. We were getting pretty close, but Mrs. Whith Swale's voice was still loud enough to be heard over for half a mile. The old woman's been hankering for setting in them Rhode Island red he eggs of yours, he shouted. Fetched his hired hand up to Tom Gould, and calculated I'd just stop and dicker with you for setting of them eggs. This later the season, I don't allow you holding them too dear. Whoa, Etta! Instead of answering Mr. Swale about the price of eggs, Mrs. Littlehale looked at me and said, Why, he's just a young boy. If it hadn't been for the sound of her voice, I wouldn't have liked it. But she didn't even give me time to think about that. She looked right into my eyes and said, I do hope you'll stay with Mr. Gould till he gets his hay in. Poor old man, him and Millie up there, trying to do it all alone. Then she turned to Mr. Swale and said, Three men he's had up there in the last week, and not one of them worth shucks. Ain't one of them stayed more than a single day. Mr. Swale's elbow poked me in the ribs as I reached back for my suitcase. He half snickered and said, So I was just to telling the boy here. Dang shame, ain't it? I jumped from the dump cat, swung my suitcase down, and started to walk up the road. For some reason, a lump had come in my throat. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I'd only gone into a dozen sets when Mrs. Little Hell called, Son? Swale to stop. I walked up, she walked up beside me, and a voice barely came out of her sunbonnet as she said, Don't let Mr. Gould rile you. He's good-hatted, and his back's a sight worse than his bite. I do hope you'll stay with him through haying. 
I just tipped my cap and said, I will. Then I went on up the road. After a dozen more steps, Mr. Swale shouted, Mind what I was saying to you. Name Swale, the other side of the four corners. But I didn't look back. That's the end, I think. Yep, that's the end of chapter one. We'll see. Maybe I can read another chapter if anybody wants to hear it. Bert, Cora, or anybody. Okay. See you later, guys.